Morning Talk on SAFM. Talking about a report by Human Rights Watch, it's a 76-page report titled Unacknowledged Deaths, Civilian Casualties in NATO's Air Campaign in Libya, and it examines in detail eight NATO airstrikes in Libya that resulted in 72 civilian deaths, including 20 women and 24 children. So we're going to take your calls as well on 0891104207, SMSs to 34701. My guest this morning, Jan Engeland, who is a Deputy Executive Director and Europe Director at Human Rights Watch, and Aisha Kaji, who is an independent analyst. Thank you so much to both of you for your time this morning. Good morning. Thank, Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Yen, let me start with you, and maybe you can tell us how this particular report was compiled and how the investigations were conducted. Well, Human Rights Watch is a worldwide human rights organization giving a lot of priority to research for us the details of the facts matter. And in Libya, we've been working for a number of years, including during um, Gaddafi's uh, dictatorship and during the war and now after. So the same researchers that documented the atrocities during the Gaddafi regime and all the violence during the war uh, also stayed on uh, to look at the consequences of the NATO bombing. You will remember that NATO had thousands of um, bombings, uh, sorties as, it's, uh, as they are called, uh, by the uh, participating countries. And we, uh, in the end, identified eight places where there had been civilian deaths uh, due to the uh, bombing, yeah. in seven of these eight places, we found that no evidence of um, any military presence. And that is why we asked NATO to do two things, investigate what really happened and why these places were bombed and compensate uh, the, uh, the victims. Now, you, one of the things you concede in the report is that uh, the number of civilian casualties were relatively low during the campaign. So NATO did take some care in minimizing civilian harm. Oh, indeed. I mean, the, this is, of course, uh, I mean, it, it may be more than 72, but we don't think that they are many more. Uh, we had, we actually investigated all the places there were rumors of um, and allegations of civilian uh, deaths. Mm. Uh, I think Russia has said there were, there are tens of thousands of people that died during the bombing campaign, a, and a figure of 30,000 has gone all across the world. I mean, it, it's very important to to uh, to to really affirm that a lot of care was done to avoid civilian casual, casualties, but it is incredible in our view that NATO alliance, which did this to fulfill a NATO, a a, a UN resolution uh, mandate, is not not willing to to follow the law, which would be investigate what happened, Mm. compensate the victims. And what are the possible uh, laws of war violations that you believe might have taken place in these sites that were visited? Well, that all depends, of course, whether there were also military legitimate targets Mm. among the civilians and how important they were. So one example, in in one of the eight places where civilians were killed, there may also have been an important uh, Libyan officer present. Then the investigation would have to identify whether the, the... military advantage uh, by attacking that officer mm. would merit civilian casualties. Uh, and and there should be a proportionality here. And normally, if several c- civilians are killed, you shouldn't even go after the military. Yeah. In the other places, like in Majer, where 34 civilians were killed, We came to the place the day after the bombing, and the bombing happened in two waves. Uh, And we could not even detect uh, any military activity in in that area. If 
a civilian, if not due care was taken mm. and a civilian target was, uh, was attacked, it could be a, a very clear violation of the laws of war. It would be a crime under international war. Let's uh, bring in Aisha Kaji into this conversation. Aisha, good morning to you good again. Morning. Now, UN Resolution 1973 was granted to protect civilians. Should we be surprised that this report has now come out pointing that maybe the opposite might have happened in some cases? Well, I don't think we're surprised. I think, I think it's, it's really a, a confirmation of previous investigations by other bodies such as Amnesty International, such as um, a UN commission itself earlier this year in March, mm-hmm. which uh, acknowledged that there were civilian casualties. However, to date, the Human Rights Watch report is perhaps the most comprehensive uh, in terms of the detail mm-hmm. uh, which, which has come through. So, yes, 1973, the the resolution of the Security Council, said very clearly that the aim of the intervention was to protect civilians. But in the end, we have found that civilians died. Quite often, this happens in war. It's not always against or or blatantly against the international wars of law, if you want. But in this case, at least these 72 deaths, including a third of which, uh, at least a third of which was, uh, were apparently children, mm. um, it's, it's become very, very clear that NATO has disregarded some of those laws of war, given that we have very, very um, sophisticated technology in we- weapon systems nowadays. Yeah. So they should have been able to determine before the attacks, in at least three or four of those cases, from what I've read on the report, that there were civilians and that there were no visible military targets in the sense that, you know, one would expect that there'd be military hardware, there'd be military vehicles, yeah. etc., in the region of a military target. What is the responsibility of the transitional national government in this? The transitional national government should actually be um, looking into these allegations, should be conducting its own investigations uh, in, in cooperation with NATO or outside cooperation with NATO. But, of course, Siki, it's not going to do that Mm. because it is a government that has, in effect, benefited from the NATO intervention and continues to benefit economically from the NATO intervention. Jan, would you agree with that? Have you spoken to the government in Libya? Yeah, we have spoken with the government. We still have hopes that they will uh, indeed investigate or demand an investigation by NATO, and they have done neither so mm. far, and that is, um, that is bad. Um, that is bad. The, uh, it, we, we need to know what really happened, also because this was, the, the whole operation was supposed to be a model of implementation for once mm. of a Security Council resolution. Most Security Council resolutions lead to very little. In, in Syria today, there is a bloodbath. More people are killed every day than the NATO campaign was responsible for the, uh, during the whole, uh, whole um, war. And there is very little action. Uh, we need to have this as a model action. It's not a model action. It's an unfinished uh, business. It's an open wound until the government requests NATO to investigate. And uh, Aisha, on that point of this uh, was supposed to, of course, be a model for um, NATO or at least for for the implementation of UN resolutions. What lessons should we learn from it? I think we should learn, particularly the countries who um, gave the thumbs up, including South Africa, to that resolution Mm. in the end. Uh, The lesson we should learn is that quite often that stated aim of preventing civilian death can be quite a naive one. And perhaps we should look at the devil in the detail, Siki. Mm. We should seek to have more detail. And uh, I, I know, you know, the, the Security Council will say, well, that's not always possible. Yeah. But certainly, with, as I said, with today's sophisticated ammunition, we- weapons technology, we should be able to have more detail. We should be able to say, well, in the event where there is a reasonable amount of doubt following mm. the guidelines of international sort of war regulations, we will not intervene when there is a reasonable um, possibility of causing widespread 
civilian death. Yeah, and I find it interesting that NATO claims that it cannot conduct post-operation inv- investigations into civilian casualties because it has no mandate to operate on the ground, and yet there's a resolution that gives it uh, powers to go and attack uh, military it, it, operations. How does that work? Well, again... I, yeah, you know, well, I, it is perhaps a consequence of the new kind of... Uh, of wars that are possible with the the um, these guided missiles precision guided missiles means that you can actually um, uh, wage war from a distance and you can uh, be able to hit exactly the building of exactly the vehicle you decide to hit even if you're on the other side of the world you sit in the united states or in europe or or or, or, or china for that matter mm. Um, the, the the good side of this is, of course, the number of civilian casualties will go down uh, because it is it's it's not like just smashing a whole area. The Second World War type of, of bombing of whole whole uh, whole towns and villages. Mm. However, doing it from a distance means that you sort of feel that well, we can only do as much as that. Now we're not on the ground. We cannot follow up. Somebody else has to follow up. We do this from a distance. Um, We think that you have exactly the same responsibilities if you're from doing it from a distance or from the air as if you're on the ground. There is no difference uh, in uh, in this. But again, I repeat, I don't think there's been this kind of a military air campaign ever in history with this with with as low a number of casualty mm-hmm. as this one in Bosnia, for example, in Kosovo, etc., where there was also, you know, um, UN mandated bombing and so on. It was much, much more um, uh, more ter- terrible for the civilians. Aisha, you wanted to comment on that? Yes, I think I think Ian is right in 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 the facts of of what he's saying that yes. The number of civilian casualties in this campaign were comparably less, uh, you know, in, in percentage-wise or in terms of actual numbers mm. than, uh, say, the campaign in, in, in Kosovo or in Bosnia. But I think that the, the fact of the matter is that the consequences of the NATO bombing campaign and the consequences of that campaign for civilians on the ground, which continue to today... Um, you know, in the form of militias that the current authority in Libya either has no control over or Mm. seeks no control over, are also things that, that, you know, ultimately the intervention must be uh, willing to look into and to take some responsibility for. And I want to talk about uh, the current state uh, of uh, Libya now and also get a view from, from Yan from a Human Rights Watch uh, perspective. And we're going to take calls as well on 08 9110 8 9110 SMSs to 34701. Talking about a 76-page report titled Unacknowledged Deaths, Civilian Casualties in NATO's Air Campaign in Libya. It was released by Human Rights Watch uh, yesterday, and they're calling on NATO to investigate civilian deaths in Libya. So we'll hear from you in a moment. Morning talk with Sikim Gabadeli. Sikim Gabadeli. In conversation with Jan Engeland, who is a Deputy Executive Director and Europe Director at Human Rights Watch, and Aisha Kaji is an independent analyst. And before we take those calls, Jan, what is the responsibility of the NATO member countries here? I know one of the things you want uh, to happen is that this this be put on the agenda at the Heads of State Summit in, in Chicago later this month. Well, we believe both NATO as an alliance has um, a responsibility. Uh, we believe that participating states have a responsibility to um, follow up the consequences of their bombing. And we believe that the UN Security Council has a responsibility since it was their resolution that asked for um, all means uh, to be taken. And, uh, and it was then NATO in the end that did the uh, the military uh, follow up, uh, so also the Security Council should uh, be held responsible mm. to finish this in a proper manner, and it's not finished in any uh, proper manner now. It's an open wound.
And uh, Aisha, you made the point a bit earlier. There have been investigations, obviously this one now by Human Rights Watch, but the UN Commission of Inquiry, Amnesty International, the Campaign for International Victims in Conflict. So which international body needs to now push for an investigation here so that this does not happen again? Well, I think all international bodies that are concerned need to push for an investigation. But the, the bodies that actually need to take responsibility, um, negotiate with the current government in, in Libya, uh, are, of course, the UN, which, as Jan so rightly says, sanctioned the intervention, yeah. and NATO itself. And, and we need to make sure that that happens. The current government in Libya, of course, has to deal with a legacy of, of years, decades of human rights violations. We know that. But given the ongoing activities still carrying on, which are in clear conflict of international human rights laws, there is a moral responsibility not only on NATO to look into the civilian casualties caused during the uh, NATO actions, but also what the consequences of those are and what the, the, the violations in, in the aftermath has been and to take steps to or to urge the government to take steps mm. and help the government provided with the resources needed to take steps to stop those. For example, Siki, mm. the pro-Gaddafi forces, the so-called Thuwar, yeah. are alleged as militias to be targeting specific ethnic and regional groups even now in mm. Libya. This is in clear violation of, of all human rights law. Is there an appetite for such an investigation from the United Nations? Um, I would say, unfortunately, not, and certainly not an appetite from some of the leading countries within the NATO coalition. And the reason for that, I have to say, in the end, comes down to pure economics and to oil economics in particular. And, Jan, what's the state of Libya at the moment? Well, uh, the jury is still out, of course. Uh, it comes out of 40 years of uh, dictatorship, of uh, of. Uh, human rights abuse of torture of of uh, killings in prisons and in the dungeons of the of the uh, interrogation centers of this regime um Aisha is right in saying that uh, that uh, it takes a long time to to come out of this they had this traumatic civil war where city was against city where a place like misrata ended up with more than 200 militias people uh, arming themselves, defending themselves, you know, uh, quarter by quarter, uh, the, uh, e- each um, factory, each uh, b- b- street got a militia. And these are still often armed. They are still there. It takes time to repair it. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I hope, and this is an important point, I think, for, also for the discussion, I, mm. I hope that Libya will not make us think that we cannot, we shouldn't care, we should not do anything, we should stand passively and look at the carnage in Syria. There is now a response, a solemn responsibility to protect, adopted by all the member states of uh, the the United Nations. Mm. I was there in the UN when this was adopted in 2005, South Africa voted for it, United States, China, Russia, all, Af- all Africa did, and it means we have an obligation um, uh, to, to, to act. We cannot just stand uh, but passively by, as it seems that most countries are now yeah. in Syria, where there isn't even an arms embargo against the regime. Oh. Well, as you say, there are wider implications. All right, we're going to take calls. Let's hear from Lala in Kempton Park. Hi, Lala. Hi, how are you, Sigi? I'm well, thank you. My question is one. I just want to find out the reason why the Human Rights Watch they are recommending compensation to to the victims rather than uh, taking the people who are responsible to the International uh, Criminal Court for genocide. Why are they not doing that? All right, I'll find Thank out. Thank you. Me. Thanks, Lala. Let's hear from Hope in Johannesburg. Morning. Uh, good morning, Siki, and to your guests. Uh, I want to ask them whether, it, with the mess happened in, in Libya, do they really expect the transitional government to can investigate when they didn't even listen to Judge Pillay, who said we should, they should investigate the circumstances of the murder of, of um, uh, Colonel Gaddafi? 
Mm -hmm. uh, the vengeful transitional national council will they really investigate uh, nato and i think the the other question was correct why are we not taking people to the international criminal court those who bomb civilians all right thanks uh bashir in linasia morning Uh, uh, hi siki morning Uh, look i i admire uh you know human rights watch organizations and so forth but you know i get the distinct impression that the media doesn't take too much uh, notice of them. And consequently, you know, uh, uh, NATO uh, feels that they can act with impunity. Uh, uh, And and why not? Uh, They're under United Nations. They are not signatories to the International Criminal Court. Uh, They have the ear, by and large, of the Western media. Uh, You know, so uh, while, yes, I admire these organizations, surely perhaps their approach should be a little different. Perhaps they should um, lobby the media a little bit more so, so, so that, uh, you know, their grievances, um, their uh, investigations can, can take a, a lot more problems. Otherwise, I think, you know, it's simply ultimately a feel-good exercise and, uh, you know, for, for all the hard work that they have put in. Right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Bashir. I'll see what my guests have to say. Name and Albert and stay on the line. I've- Morning Talk with Siki Mgabadeli. Siki Mgabadeli. In conversation with Jan Egerland, who is Deputy Executive Director and Europe Director at Human Rights Watch, and Aisha Kaji is an independent analyst. I'm going to read SMSs and also uh, give my guests a chance to respond to the calls. Let's just hear from Naeem and Alberton. Morning. Uh, hello. Uh, greetings to you and your guests. Mm. Uh, three aspects. Uh, firstly, your, the uh, guest from Human Rights Watch, uh, he seems to be actually protecting NATO in a sense. Uh, I think the whole question of the NATO intervention itself, in principle, ought to be, uh, you know, questioned. The, the whole thing was an act of aggression. Uh, you know, he seems to be just focusing on uh, eight uh, sorties that killed 72 civilians. And in that sense, he's kind of uh, justifying and endorsing the other thousands of uh, uh, attacks on, on Libya. I mean, the, uh, the resolution called for a no-fly zone to protect civilians. It didn't call for uh, bombing of uh, military targets. It didn't call for bombing of civilian infra- infrastructure. It didn't call for bombing of uh, cities. I mean, how can he, uh, you know, uh, bombing of Tripoli, the bombing of Sirte when, uh, when the re- uh, regime was on his last legs. I mean, there was no, there were no threat to anybody. They were actually on the defensive. And uh, for about a month, NATO bombed cert. I mean, how can that be justified? Second point. Uh, I, uh, one of the callers raised the point of the media and Human Rights Watch. Is it the silence of the media or is it actually the silence of Human Rights Watch? Uh, you know, I, I raise this because on Syria, they, uh, the, you know, they issued a report con- uh, for the first time actually condemning the rebels about a year into the uh, after uh, the rebel, uh, r- rebels have been bombing and, and creating havoc for over a year before uh, Human Rights Watch actually raised this in a report. Uh, final point. Uh, the, the, the whole, uh, you know, uh, Aisha Kaji says it's the detail, and I think that's uh, a crucial point. The devil is in the detail, because, uh, you know, how do you uh, decide uh, was it the intention to kill civilians or not, uh, if they make a claim that there was some kind of military presence in a particular area, you know, all these details, that, that's where legally the whole thing gets all bogged down and then, and, and, mm. you, you know, it becomes very uh, unhelpful. All right. Thanks, Naeem. Let Thank me get a response from my guests. I'm going to take calls in a moment. I think we've got quite a bit um, to deal with. And let me start with you, Yen. Uh, your response? Well, there were a, a number of, uh, of uh, questions, many good questions. Um, well, the, the resolution of the, the UN says uh, any necessary means. Uh, the interpretation of that yeah. is, you know, it, it can be interpreted in many different ways where human rights organization, uh, we are very unhappy when countries sit on the fence and do nothing. And of course, the Security Council for many months did nothing. Um, faced with the atrocities of uh, Gaddafi in Libya, faced with the atrocities of Assad in Syria, mm. in both places it started by the regime shooting at, bombing its own c- citizens that were unarmed. 
That's how it started. The, the, these are the facts. Um, w- what about going to the International Criminal Court? Well, the whole matter is by the uh, Security Council transferred to the International uh, Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court can indict anybody or everybody uh, that they want. Uh, they, uh, I think the prosecutor has said that the killing of uh, Muhammad Gaddafi himself might be, uh, might be among the things they will investigate. We cannot say that this, <laughs> this, this as the caller said, this is genocide, what the NATO did. This is, uh, this, these are, uh, uh, by definition, international crimes. We say we went to, uh, we found eight sites out of the thousands of bombings that took place. Of eight of these thousands, there are very serious questions, and, if, and, and seven of the eight seems to indicate that they actually killed civilian targets. And that's why this is so serious, and that's why we say there has to be a follow-up. In, in, in the Majir case, I don't know if, if we did mention that, mm. we documented in the second bombing uh, the, they, uh, they killed a number of first responders, I mean, neighbors and others who, who came to this place to care for, for, for wounded. And that is the, uh, probably the most serious case. And, and that has to be followed up. Yeah. And that could lead, yes, to, to um, criminal investigations, because that could well, one of the, the callers, Bashir in Lanesia, saying, you know, NATO just thinks that it can act with impunity and that maybe human rights organizations such as yourselves should change your approach in the way that you get these sorts of investigations out into the public domain. Which we're doing now. I mean, the, the, it's, this is the most um, detailed investigations that anybody has done. Even, not even the UN did this kind of detailed investigations. We have uh, invested many, many months of, um, of uh, research at time going from site to site, interviewing all neighbors, all the wounded, all the families, uh, looking at details and the rubbles and so on. And we document then, you know, to, to the extent um, enormous question marks uh, for NATO that this is major news in the United States, in France, in um, in the UK, in my own country, Norway, that participated in the campaign. In, Den- in all of the participating campaigns, this is a major self-searching um, report through the media. Uh, we are really going after those responsible. As we have, as you will remember, criticized South Africa, India, mm. and other countries in the Security Council for, for being too passive on, on, a, on a number of instances, Sta- standing by and, um, and not uh, living up to the solemn principle of a responsibility to protect civilians. Aisha? Um, thinking, I think, you know, there's several issues that have been raised. Um, certainly amongst them the issue of the International Criminal Court. I think the first step towards something like that needs to be um, an investigation by Mm. the current government in Libya, um, as well as an investigation by NATO and the countries involved in NATO, as Diana said, a self-examination. And public pressure can bring that about, because only when it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, finally concluded that there were legitimate legal or there are legitimate legal bases to say that war crimes were committed. Because remember, the ICC only tries certain levels of crimes. Mm. Only when you can say with some confidence, with some detail, that war crimes were committed and that specific persons or specific entities or specific countries even could be held accountable, for example, like in the um, issue of, of the incident investigated by Human Rights Watch, where the second bombing of the Maja compound mm. would, should clearly, or it would seem, is clearly in conflict with international law, where the pilot ought to have seen that there would be civilian casualties, many civilian casualties of those coming to assist the wounded 
of the yes. first uh, bombing. That's right, absolutely. And in, in that kind of case, you know, the international law clearly states you need to cancel or suspend that action or you need to give adequate warning. In that case, it didn't happen. Perhaps mm-hmm. there are many other cases. Absolutely. And as uh, Jan was saying, uh, here, obviously, they're focused on these eight. But if seven out of eight sites are out of thousands, Mm -hmm. um, there are these problems, then, you know, one's got to ask the question about what happened in other sites where um, an investigation was not possible. But just, yeah. May I agree and interject that? I mean, because we, we had people all over Libya, we investigated all of the places where there were allegations, Mm. rumors, of um, any civilian casualties and they so the these are the eight places i i should not casualties deaths deaths yeah there are places where civilians were wounded elsewhere we went after where where people died uh, are there other than the eight places civilians died we do we do not know for sure but we doubt it now because mm. we have been there for many months and we crisscrossed uh, the country so the other thousands were, um, it seems, uh, military targets. And the incident that uh, Aisha was talking about in, in Majer, where uh, people were the, the first strike, obviously, uh, on two family compounds, killing 34 yeah. civilians and wounding more than 30. And then a second strike outside of one of those compounds killed and wounded civilians who witnesses were saying were actually searching for victims. Yeah, that is the most serious mm. of all of them, and that is the one that uh, I, I would personally also say is the clearest to vi- a, 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 a clear-cut violation of the, the laws of war, um, be- be- because it was so clear that civilians had, had run to this place. What does NATO say? NATO says that this was a military command and control post mm. inside of these places. People were directing forces. We went there the day after. We could not trace any, any detect any, any indications of this being true. Here's some SMSs. Yanda Watuguza says South Africa must also carry blame for signing Resolution 1973, colliding or colluding, Ramsar, I suppose you mean, with imperialists. Becky was correct. This was recolonization of Africa. Spio and KZN says whether NATO abused its mandate or not, the fact of the matter is that the AU had no answer to Gaddafi's threats. Its leaders, including South Africa, are too compromised. Uh, Bongani uh, in UKZN says the permit to kill and destroy infrastructure and Libyans was given by South Africa when our UN ambassador was woken up to vote for UN Resolution 1973. Uh, Matota says, are people's lives worth dollars or pounds that you just destroy people's lives and you can do and you can give all you can do is give them money? Why not take NATO leaders to The Hague? And Ellie in Cape Town says, Will your propagandist contributors tell us how they dealt with 40 years of Gaddafi's human rights abuses and international crimes? So before I take the calls, do you want to respond to that, Jan? Well, uh, I think uh, on, on this we have a stand. We, we, we think that it was a good thing that South Africa and the unanimous, uh, or a, a near unanimous council Finally, after many months of slaughtering of civilians, thousands of civilians in Libya, acted on the responsibility to protect resolution. And remember, it was the Arab League that initiated this process. The U.S., uh, the Americans were against the whole thing. The the Arab League asked for a no-fly zone. They said we cannot stand passively by and looking at our Arab brethren runs blood being spilt by the, uh, the hands of a dictator. So, so we were very critical, as were most uh, organizations, north, south, east, west, mm. of uh, paralysis in, 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 the, in the Security Council. Then, uh, finally, uh, South Africa and the others act with a, a resolution. The follow-up should, in my personal view, have been a joint action by the Arab, uh, the Arab League, African Union, and NATO jointly. It shouldn't have ended up as as as, as more or less a pure NATO operation. Mm. 
um, having this now new sort of north-south um, divide yeah. on what happened, why it happened, was it the good thing, was it the bad, bad thing? This should have been the new beginning of responsibility to protect and an end to passively standing by and looking at, at, at people's being slaughtered. Aisha, and, and just for you to speak to that point as well, because it's one, some, one of the things that obviously some of the SMSs are speaking to, but Naeem also saying that the intervention should be questioned in principle. Yes, I think in principle it should be questioned. I think Jan is quite right to say that, um, you know, the North-South um, cooperation perhaps should have been more visible, should have been more uh, formal, and so that the AU and the Arab League would have had a voice in, um, you know, ongoing interventions once it became clear that civilians were suffering. Mm. Um, however, I think, you know, that, that perhaps at this stage, with the exception of, of the, you know, Unimid uh, uh, peacekeepers in, in, uh, in Darfur, that kind of intervention is still in its very, very early stages, that north-south cooperation mm. or cooperation between entities such as the UN or NATO mm. and, and southern entities such as uh, or, or, or development entities such as or developing entities mm. such as the AU and, and, and the Arab League. So I think, I think it's, it's certainly something to be considered and something we must look more into. But I think also, Siki, you know, we can't end this program without looking at the responsibility yeah of Libya's current government and the NATO countries as we go forward, both in terms of the ongoing violence in Libya at the moment and also in terms of how Libya's oil sector is now going to be used and the transparency or lack thereof Mm. in that sector and who benefits companies like Britain's BP, companies like France's total companies like Italy's ENI and companies like the U.S.'s Exxon. We need to take that into account because we all know that part of the reason for those countries' intervention in Libya was certainly their own economic interest. And the fact that Libya is the world's ninth largest oil producer should give us pause for thought. Wow. Shane in Westville, good morning. Uh, good, mo- good morning, Siki. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'd just like to, just two points, uh, with NATO, I think the majority of the world wanted that, so I support that fully. It's just unfortunate that uh, innocent people died on both sides, so I think they should investigate both sides and not just one. And my second point is, you just mentioned that some compound was hit and 34 innocent people died, which is unfortunate, but at the same time, on average, we have 50 people murdered in South Africa a day, so... That's a war itself. So we should also be taking our government to the RCC to try and stop the war we have in our, in our own country. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. All right. Uh, Begicha in Cape Town. Morning. <coughs> you know, I think it is not right that, uh, you know, Africa is, is played around by Europe and America like this, you know, taken for granted. And most of the time, you, you, you want to believe that these countries use the very <coughs> big institutions to, to legitimize their atrocities, which actually they commit you know, to us, which they commit when they want, you know, whatever they want from Africa, they will utilize the very institutions. You see, I mean, look at the fact that, for example, uh, these people, they kill Bin Laden, they throw you know, him to the sea, and, and, and nobody really challenges that. I mean, is that not a human rights issue? So this, this is not right. And, and I mean, you see, we will talk and talk and talk, and I know, and there will be no recourse. We can talk as much until Jesus comes down. We will, there will be no recourse to, 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 to these atrocities because they were controlled by these guys. You see, I don't know whether it is because they've got muscle, financial muscle, but they are controlling us. And I'm challenging, you know, African leaders in, in this, that really, they, they must not really toler- tolerate this nonsense. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Bikicha. Um, Mohammed in Lanesia, could morning. Hi, Siki. Hi to your guest. Mm. Siki, I'd like to take issue with your guest who said the Arab League were fallen off by his own. When that vote was taken, only five of the 15 members of the Arab League attended that meeting. And who are those five members? Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, all who are now having human rights violations in their own countries. So that's a just ingenious uh, uh, use to, of justifying that war. Secondly, when he talks about the ICC, uh, the Americans are responsible for over 2 million killings in Iraq. Did the ICC do anything against them? 
Then the Palestinian issue after Operation Castlet, the Palestinians went to the ICC. The ICC now suddenly says that Palestinians are not a state, so they cannot take a state to the ICC. So they come with all these fancy uh, type of laws when it's just to justify Europe and Israel. I mean, tomorrow when Israel attacks civilians, is NATO going to attack Israel? That's what I would like to know from all NATO members. All right, well, they're not here. Eunice in Johannesburg. Yeah, Morning. hi, Siki. Hi. Siki, you know, the question is who polices the police? Mm. NATO indiscriminately bombs, and you'll just have an investigation either by Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch, and nothing happens. As we talk now, civilians are being massacred in Afghanistan. Little children going and herding sheep are slaughtered daily. People going for weddings. You know, the same thing, it's over and over again. Now, in the question of, of, of Libya, I think Aisha hit the nail on the head. Maybe she should consider carpentry, carpentry as a second profession, oh. you know. <laughs> but, you know, the question, it is all about oil. And, you know, the truth is now coming out, the Bellasconis of this world and the Sarkozy's of this world willingly took millions of dollars from Gaddafi. That's, that's the first thing. But my question to Jan is, you cannot expect the TNC to do an impartial investigation when right now they are holding thousands of prisoners in, in detention centers in, in under atrocious conditions in Libya. So to, to, to say that now, you know, you'd expect them to do anything about the, uh, the, the civilian deaths, you, you know, you're not good. It's like going to a brick wall there. And uh, the point is, like previous scholars have said, who's going to take these people to the ICC? You're not going to get any, any resolution from anyone here because the ICC is just going to throw these things out. And, you know, every sort of legality comes in. They're not members of the ICC or whatever. And NATO continues to do this. Uh, all they look is at their economic interests. All right. Thanks, Thanks Eunice. And final call, Temba in Kempton Park. Morning. Temba. All right, I think we might have lost him, but I don't know what's going on with his line. All right, I think let's uh, let's deal with some of the issues that have been raised right now and maybe start with the last one. Aisha, who polices the police? Well, I think that's that's the, the, the whole issue at stake here, and that's certainly what comes out from the recommendations that Human Rights Watch has published in this report, mm. that it is really up to, um, you know, the countries that form the NATO alliance to actually take responsibility. Um, and, of course, if nobody polices them, then it should be up to civil society in the form of organizations such as Human Rights Watch and others to lobby for individual governments involved in those strikes, to lobby for NATO as a body, to cooperate with, um, you know, calls for a, a, a thorough investigation, um, to provide details, particularly about those uh, specific strikes that have been identified, which NATO claims were command and control posts, etc., mm. well then give us details. Let the public know why you said that certain targets were military targets and therefore, uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of justifiable target under the conditions of just, bello, of just war. Mm. Um, on the issue of the ICC, uh, without wanting to, to uh, you know, conflate issues here. We must also give credit where it's due. A senior lawyer at the ICC yesterday has asked um, that the court actually take action against Libya, reported to the UN Security Council, over its failure to extradite Saif al-Islam. Now, you know, whatever one thinks or doesn't think of the ICC, it's certainly trying to enforce the warrants that it put out earlier. Um, And we need to give credit where that's due. And also, we need to acknowledge that Quite a few of the countries within the uh, Security Council will be unwilling to hand over people like mm. Islam. And Jan, in your request to NATO for information, for detail um, in their Libya campaign, what was their response? Uh, in, in, we have uh, hit a brick wall here uh, because NATO centrally says um, that they cannot provide the exact information um, including the films, we ha- we have asked for the, f- the you know each each airplane makes a video yeah. out of its um, its strike. We ask for the evidence. We ask for the videos. NATO uh, says that has to come from the participating states. The participating states basically says you have to get answers from NATO. Mm, uh, the yeah. investigations must take place. I think in a combination of NATO. Uh, participating states 
and the Commission of Inquiry Institution of the United Nations. The United Nations uh, Commission of Inquiry uh, echoes exactly what we have called for the whole time, yeah. an investigation by the member states, but I think the UN should also follow up on this one. It's part of a, a larger picture, though. I, I sense from very many of the callers, they they are angry with sort of international hypocrisy in general, um, mm. and they, in a way, now feel, feel that this is, a, is, is yet again an example of, um, of the hypocrisy of the West, of the, of the rich country, of the powers, and so on. And I, I couldn't agree more that the world is full of hypocrisy. I mean, the, 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 the Western powers supported the Mubarak regime and the Ben Ali regime in in Egypt and Tunisia. There were all sorts of deals made yeah. um, with uh, Gaddafi, uh, just as so many countries are, are making deals, not the Western ones, the, the Russians, the Chinese and others, with uh, Assad in uh, Syria, which now has 10,000 people's uh, bloods on his uh, hands and, the, and that of the, of the regime. And there isn't even an arms embargo. So I think the hypocrisy, there is more enough hypocrisy to go around all over the world. And let's just uh, agree that there is a joint responsibility to, to follow up here. Uh, here. And I think I, Aisha was very right in saying that there must be more joint operations, north, south, east, west. I I am, as a Westerner, you know, fed up by the West being involved in all of these operations uh, using force. But the point is, there is no one else uh, really stepping up to the plate on these ones, say, in, in, in Libya. I was hoping yeah. for a Arab-led operation. Uh, I think Darfur is a good example of South Africa also playing a leadership role. Let's hope for Africa now playing a leadership role in Somalia, where, you know, Thousands and thousands of people have died every single year for a generation. We have to leave it there because it's 10 o'clock. Thank you very so much time this morning. Thank you. Jan Egeland is Deputy Executive Director and Europe Director at Human Rights Watch and Independent Analyst, Aisha Kaji, an 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 analyst.